You know, last week uh, we were in Elise. Uh, she, she was down a little bit, uh, a little sick, and uh, she's recovered quite nicely. As a matter of fact, Ellen and I were talking about it uh, last night that we've never seen her happier in her entire life. As, as you remember, uh, she's, she's working in a prison in North Carolina, and she really enjoys uh, prison life. Uh, she's got her own car, a uh, brand new car, a new car to her anyway, and she's got her apartment. She's making a lot of friends, making a lot of friends right there in the prison. Matter of fact, she's got a nice boyfriend now, and uh, as a matter of fact, uh, he's due to be paroled in six years, so, so we're, we're excited about that, so, but, uh, but it's still kind of a, a scary thing to, uh, to have a daughter um, uh, basically kind of like living in prison. Uh, she's, uh, uh, she told me a few weeks ago that she was having a, uh, a class on what happens when one of the inmates rapes one of the guards, and which that was a little disconcerting for me, but... Um, uh, you, you, you worry about it sometimes. And I was coming out of Wegmans uh, a couple days later, and I saw on the Daily News uh, an article about a, a convict in, in, Ry in Rikers, uh, Rikers Island prison in New York uh, raping one of the guards, one of the female guards. And, of course, the, the other prisoners came to her, to her aid, so they, they saved her from that. But it's uh, kind of a scary idea. Uh, all these people that uh, have committed these horrendous crimes, and yet uh, people are exposed to them still that could still be hurt by them. Uh, I'm wondering how we should deal with the issue of capital punishment. William F. Buckley once did a, a report on capital punishment in America. He, he had some statistics about it. From 1976 to 1990, there were 265,000 murders in America. In that time period, there was only 125 executions. Which leads me to the question of how we as Christians uh, should look at capital punishment. How do we view it? Well, let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much for your uh, word this morning. We thank you for your love and your grace. And we thank you for your mercy, Lord, that uh, indeed we talked this, we sang this morning about how, how how indescribable your love is and how merciful you are, Lord. And we praise you and thank you for that. And we pray it in the precious name of our Savior. Amen. Amen. 1998, there was a, a woman by the name of Carla Faye Tucker. Uh, she was due to be executed in, in the state of Texas. Uh, she was accused of killing strung out on drugs. She killed the people. At her trial, she claimed that she was innocent. When, when she got to prison, uh, she had a conversion to Christ. Uh, she became a born-again Christian. Uh, she had a tremendous ministry in Christian leading other prisoners to Christ. She had a viable ministry, and uh, it came time for her execution, and I had this, this gut-wrenching feeling that, oh, Lord, don't let it happen. And there were a number of people that were interceding to the governor of Texas at the time. One of them was Pat Robertson, uh, Pope John Paul II, the president of Italy, the president of the U.N., Newt Gingrich, all petitioned to have her execution stayed. And I remember the day that she died, I had a tear in my eye because I was thinking, this is, this is a sister in Christ that's being executed. And so sometimes we as Christians have ambivalent feelings about capital punishment. Uh, you know, sometimes we, we look at it and we think of God's mercy, you know, forgiveness. And uh, a lot of Christians uh, don't believe in capital punishment because uh, if, if, you, if you kill somebody, they're never going to come to Christ. If you keep them in prison for years and years and years and years, it's quite possible that they could come to Christ. So there's a lot of people that are... Uh, ambivalent about it. You know, as Christians, too, we want to be good stewards of, of, of the government. And, you know, when, when somebody has uh, uh, been pronounced by, by the judge to have capital punishment, they'll, they'll appeal it and appeal it and appeal it, and it'll be 30, 40 years before it's actually carried out to the expense of the taxpayer. So there's that problem, too. And sometimes there's, like, a, a problem with capital punishment. Sometimes we have overzealous uh, prosecutors. Uh, remember the story of uh, Anthony Capozzi? Uh, he was accused of being the bike path rapist. You remember, the bike path rapist was murdering and killing women in, in Clarence. And uh, somebody got a, made a sketch of the bike path rapist and uh, put it in the Buffalo News. And somebody sitting in a, in a fast food restaurant in North Buffalo saw Anthony Capozzi walking by the restaurant and said, Hey, look, that guy looks like the, the, bike, path the, bike, the bike path rapist. So they arrested him, uh, tried him, and convicted him, and put him to jail. And uh, it, thanks to the efforts of uh, 
um, Dennis Delano and others, they got him off. Had they executed him, they would have executed an innocent man because of overzealous prosecutors. So sometimes we as Christians <coughs> look at capital punishment in, in, in an ambivalent way. Uh, we, we, we think of God's mercy. We think of God's mercy toward us and God should have mercy toward these people. And yet, uh, there's these, there does seem like there should be something to do about it. So Christians have ambivalent feelings about it. But secular humanists uh, oftentimes are against uh, capital punishment, too. Uh, I was reading a story about uh, a crime that was committed in South Africa, in Johannesburg, South Africa. I mean, now South Africa, you know, is on the, on the, the, uh, the southernmost tip of, of Africa. And uh, there was a... a a, a, a news team out doing a remote and they had the cameras all set up and they were going to do the remote and in comes a burglar or, or I'm sorry a robber he comes by and doing the, the newscast he, he steals the man's computer and steals the man's headsets right there in front of the whole world I mean it's like uh, it's like somebody robbing the eyewitness news team. I mean, in South Africa, they've got this tremendous crime problem, a lot of murder, a lot of cr criminal activity. But you imagine somebody robbing the eyewitness news team while they're filming. I mean, to do that, you'd have to be crazy to do that. And so the humanists look at crime as if it's just crazy. You, you, you'd be crazy to rob the eyewitness news team. You'd be crazy to commit a lot of crimes. And certainly, you would be crazy if you murdered somebody. And so secular humanists believe that uh, it's, all, it's all due to, to craziness. It's, it's, it's a kind of insanity. And that seems to be the prevailing idea in, in, in our culture, too. I mean, if, it, it's entered the political realm. I mean, if, if you want to defeat your political opponent, the best way to do it is just say, he's crazy, or he has crazy ideas or he's doing crazy things and that's the way secular humanists look at this it's, it, they've taken it from the realm of moral and put it into the realm of pathological anybody that does anything must be crazy they need to be straightened out and so you'll notice that coming up in in how we describe our our, our prisons they're no longer penitentiaries or penal institutions they're correctional facilities. You don't go there for punishment for crime. You go to be corrected. My daughter called me up a, a few weeks ago and she said, Dad, they don't even call the wardens warden anymore. They call them the administrators. They're the CEOs of the Correctional Institute. So that's the way uh, uh, secular humanists uh, argue the position that, uh, that capital punishment is retribution for a crime. You're just getting even with somebody because they did something bad. Lewis at this point in the God doc where he it, it's just a series of lectures that that uh, are a series of articles that he wrote that he combined into a book and it's actually putting God in, in, on trial and one of the articles he wrote is the humanistic view of of punishment and the idea is that these people are all kind of crazy that do do these kind of crazy things and they need to be corrected they need to be institutionalized where they can be corrected by by people so what they've done they, they've taken the the uh, uh, the crime or the moral aspect of, of, of murder and transfer it into the pathological aspect. You need to straighten these people out. So you've taken them out of the hands of, of, of correctional administrators and, and put them into the hands of psychologists where they can straighten out their minds. And uh, I've got nothing against psychologists. I think psychologists are wonderful. We need psychologists. I mean, this, this, I hate to say it, but I think the world's crazy. You need psychologists in this world. And uh, I studied uh, psychology under Drs. Minnerith and Meyer down in the Dallas Clinic. And so I have a little understanding of psychology, but I love it. I mean, I was listening to John Roseman the other day, and he just absolutely has great insights in, into the human mind. And we need people like that to help us to think through our problems. But what Lewis is arguing is that when you give the penal institutions over to the psychologists, it's tyranny. Uh, you, 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 it's dehumanizing to take a, take a human being who's committed a crime and try to straighten out his mind. It's, it's like what they do in the communist world. If you ever notice what's going on in communist China or communist North Korea, that's how they view crime. They, 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 they take people, put them in prison, and straighten them out. Uh, Kim Jong-il, the former prime minister, of, uh, but um, he wanted to make North Korea's uh, movie industry competitive with America. Uh, so in order to do that, he kidnapped the most famous movie actress in South Korea, and he kidnapped the most famous 
uh, film producer in South Korea and brought him to North Korea. Well, the, the, the film actress complied with his wishes, uh, but the movie producer didn't comply with, his, with what, what Kim Won had done. So Kim put him into a, a hard labor facility for four years. And after four years of being in this, this hard labor, he was converted to the North Korean way of thinking, and he produced some very fine films for the North Korean people. But that's the way secular humanists view uh, crime. It's all crazy. People need to be straightened out. Capital punishment is just retribution. You're just getting even with somebody. But what does the Bible say about capital punishment? Now the earth uh, was, was corrupt in God's sight and was, the fall and was full of violence. God saw how corrupt uh, the earth had become and all the people in the earth and, and how corrupted their ways. Uh, we were talking uh, a few weeks ago about the Great Tribulation, whether Christians are going to go through the Great Tribulation. And, and Vail proffered the idea that there's a tribulation before the Great Tribulation. And, and I, I kind of buy the idea because uh, what Paul says in the end times, men's hearts will grow cold. And uh, the, the, the latter days, just uh, biblically speaking, all, all, when we speak of the latter days, all you're speaking of is the time that Christ arises into heaven. Afterward, those are the latter days. So we've been in the latter days ever since Christ arose up in heaven. But there is this sense in which as we go closer and closer to the coming of Christ, Things become more violent because men's hearts become more cold. And that's the society we seem to be living in. There's things that are happening now in my day that I can't even imagine happening in the 1950s and 1960s when, when I was growing up. For example, uh, there's a threat by ISIS that uh, they're going to bomb the malls. And Ellen and I are looking at each other going, well, I don't know if we're going to go to the mall anymore because they're threatening to bomb the Mall of America. And you see all kinds of brazen criminal activity that you would never see I earlier. I, I was reading a, an article in the Buffalo News about a man that was... Uh, uh, he had robbed, and so they put him in prison. He got out. He robbed again, put him in prison. He got out again, and he's, he was caught robbing and raping a woman in a convenient food store. And so it's just, just, just this brazen crime just keeps going on and on and on. And, and we just seem to be living in a world that's far more violent than, than I knew when I was younger. And, uh, and I don't know what it was like... <laughs> During the time of Noah, this comes from the book of Genesis, and I don't know what it was like at this time. I don't know the culture milieu. I don't know what kinds of cell phones they were using at the time. I don't know what kind of computer games the kids were playing with. But the inference in that passage is that it's a time of great violence. Violence has come into the land. The violence has come in so much, become so prominent, that God is going to execute judgment upon the world in the way of a flood. So he brings judgment to the world in the way of a flood, and then he says this to Noah, And for your life will I will surely demand an accounting. I will demand an accounting from every animal, from every human being too. I will demand an accounting for the life of another human being. Whoever sheds human blood by humans shall their blood be shed. For in the image of God, God has made mankind. Before this time, I'm a dispensationalist. Now someday we're going to do a do a series of, of studies on what dispensationalism, but ba the basic idea is that God has governed the world up until this time through men's conscience. After this time, to judge men or judge the world or interact with the world through government activity. He authorizes governments now to take the life of those that shed innocent blood. Why? Well, men are made image of God, the image and likeness of God. And so in some sense, when you shed the life of a man, you're trying to shed the life of God. Or, and, and so this is an affront to God. So God has authorized government to take the life of people that shed innocent blood. And so during that dispensation, dispensation of government, you're going to give up your life if you take another man's life. He later goes on in the, in the dispensation, in the Mosaic dispensation, where God gives laws to Moses and God's going to re relate to the world through the Mosaic dispensation. Uh, he gives other reasons for capital punishment. Kidnapping is a punishable offense, and it's punishable by capital punishment. Bestiality, homosexuality, these are all sins punishable by death. And my favorite one is, is, uh, 
is if a prophet speaks and the prophecy doesn't come true, he's to be punished, he's, he's to be executed with capital punishment. Which leads me to, the, to, to understand, why do some of these preachers and some of these, these people on television make all these extravagant prophecies knowing <laughs> that God is against that. If that prophecy comes through, it doesn't come true, you've made God look foolish. God is very much against that. But at any rate, that, that, that the idea of capital punishment continue, or, or, or is founded in the Old Testament and it continues in the New Testament. Remember the story of, of in, in uh, John chapter 19 is the Jewish people. And the Jewish people are saying, well, you know, this, this Jesus, he's claiming to be God, and that's against our law, and so we need him to be executed. We can't do it with our law, but you can do it, Pontius Pilate, with your law, with the Roman Empire, you, have, you, you, you can't punish him. And, and Pilate sitting there goes, well, this is to do with me. I don't even understand what this man has done. He's innocent in my eyes. So he's wrestling with them. You know, what's he going to do with the Jewish people? What's happy, but at the same time, uh, he, he's, he feels like he's, he, he, he's going to be interfering with, with an innocent man. So he goes up to Jesus. He walks in and Jesus, you know, let me ask you one question, Jesus. Just one question. Jesus, where are you from? And Jesus is just silent. He doesn't even answer Pilate. And Pilate looks at him and says, Jesus, do you not understand? that I have the authority to set you free, and I have the authority to crucify you. And Jesus just looks at him and says, yeah, you have that authority because you got it from above. Jesus is saying, Pontius Pilate, yeah, you have that authority to execute. The question is, where did Pilate get the authority to execute Jesus? He got it from, Roman, uh, from Genesis chapter 9. That was given to the government, and it was and it isn't abrogated in, in the New Testament. Example, in, in uh, Acts chapter 25. If you remember Acts chapter 25, uh, Paul is standing there before F uh, Festus. Remember, Festus replaces Felix as the governor of Judea. And uh, Festus says to him, well, you know, you, you want, the Jews want to try you. And it says, Paul looks at him and says, well, I, want, I, I appeal to Caesar. I want to be tried by Caesar. And uh, and Festus says, well, do you really want to go before Caesar? Says, yeah, I'll go before Caesar. Caesar has the authority to kill me. If I have done something wrong, I do not deny that Caesar has the authority to execute me, indicating that the capital punishment still remains valid in the New Testament. And you see it, it's valid in, in, the, in, the, day, in the age of the church. Romans chapter 13, the, the passage that Laura read from this morning, was uh, uh, Paul says that... Uh, that the government does not carry the sword in vain. And I take the sword to be a metaphor for capital punishment. And so what Paul is saying is that they have the authority to execute. And I think inherent in the idea is that capital punishment is, a, is also deterrent. I think the main focus of cap capital punishment, and this is an argument that C.S. Lewis makes in, in, in discussion, uh, that the main focus of capital punishment is penal. It's, it's not attribution. It's it's penal. But along, but along that, 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 that same lines is the idea that it acts as a deterrent. Capital punishment acts as a deterrent. If you don't think so, uh, I would just uh, make an allusion to the, to the mafia. Now, I, I'm not going to put down the mafia. I, I, I love the mafia because I, you know, I don't want anybody saying that I say anything negative about the mafia because they're going to put a hit out on me or something. And Mrs. Haggerty, as a matter of fact, uh, loved the, the guys in the mafia. She said they were some of the most gentlemanly men that she ever dated, the guys in the mafia. They always treated her like a lady. So I've got nothing against the mafia, but the mafia have a, a, a rule of silence. If you squeal on the mafia, you're going to find yourself in the East River wearing a pair of cement shoes. It works. Nobody squeals in the mafia. Capital punishment works as a deterrent. So I think that's what Paul's getting at, too, as far as um, capital punishment. It does work as a deterrent. I think the main idea is not retribution. It's not remedial. It's penal. You're to pay a price for what you've done. Now, a lot of people look at the Bible, and they see contradictions in the Bible. They see tension. And some of the, the, some of the tensions I, I see is... Um, if you remember the story in John chapter 8, Jesus with the woman uh, that's accused of adultery. If you remember the story, 
the Jews bring this woman before Jesus. He's accused of adultery. And uh, they, they say, Jesus, this woman's accused of adultery. She should be stoned. Well, Jesus kneels down in, in the ground. He starts writing something. And then he stands up and, and he looks at them and it says that he who is without sin, let them cast the first stone. Kneels down again. He starts writing. Now, I don't know what he's writing. Dr. McGee always, <laughs> Dr. McGee said that he was writing the names of all the guys that were having, a, the women of, the, that these guys were having affairs with. I don't really, no one really knows what Jesus was writing. But the point is, he stands up there and he says, woman, where are your accusers? These guys all scatter. So people infer from the passage that God is doing away with or abrogating capital punishment. But that's not the case. What Jesus is doing is showing their hypocrisy. He's pointing out that this is, this is a fabricated case. Uh, they're just bringing up charges to try to trick him or play games with him or something. But it doesn't abrogate capital punishment. The, the idea that... Uh, that people use to, to believe that, that, that capital punishment is abrogated in, in, in the New Testament is in, in uh, the Sermon on the Mount in, in Matthew chapter 5. Uh, Jesus says, you an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, but I'm going to give you another way of dealing. You're to love, you're to love people. And so people like that say, well, yeah, he's done away uh, with capital punishment. No more eye for an eye and tooth for a tooth. We're just to love and accept each other. Uh, I think that's a false Jesus is trying to do there. He's teaching these people uh, that they have misinterpreted the law, they've twisted and contorted the law, and they've used the law for their own purposes. I'll give you an illustration. In John chapter 5, uh, Jesus heals a man that's been lame from his birth. This man has never walked. Every time, every time, he, carry, every time he has to go somewhere, somebody has to carry him on a mattress. Well, Jesus walks up to him, and he heals the man. And he says to the man, get up and carry your, 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 your mattress. And so he, he stands up, starts walking, carries his mattress, and the Jews are all bent out of shape. They're all, they're all apoplectic. Uh, this man healed on the Sabbath. They didn't care that this man was able to walk. They had no compassion, no love for the man. All they cared about was the law. And that's what Jesus is saying in chapter, John, uh, Matthew chapter 5. Uh, don't go to the extremity of the law. There's a, there's a greater principle, love. And he's not saying that you shouldn't punish a criminal. If a criminal does something that's wrong, does something that's a violent crime, he has to be accountable for it. You just don't say, oh, I forgive you and love you. Uh, for example, if, if, if I'm wrong and he violently raped my daughter, I would look at him and say, oh, man, you shouldn't have done that, but I love you anyway. Don't, don't worry about it. And then the next day he violently rapes my other daughter. And I look at him, well, you know, don't worry about it, man. It's, it's fine. Don't, don't worry about it. It's all is forgiven. And then the next day, he rapes my wife. I look at him and say, well, don't worry about him. Uh, don't worry about it, man. It's, it's all right. I forgive you. No, the, the concept is absurd. That's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying you, you need to be accountable for what you've done, but you do everything in love, and you don't go to these, the, no twist and contort the law. Uh, another passage might be the one with Cain and Abel. Uh, Cain, Cain, sl Cain slays Abel. And Cain has never, never received capital punishment for what he's done to, 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 to Abel. Uh, I guess number one is that capital punishment hasn't been authorized yet, because you know, capital punishment isn't authorized until Genesis chapter 9. The other idea is that uh, God, if, in his own purpose, is in that early in, in the stages of man's development, probably wants to use Cain 